Okay, so today's book review is uh, Rules, Patterns, and Words, Grammar and Lexis in English Language Teaching by Dave Willis. Uh, a couple notes. First of all, this is one of those books that I read for professional development. So, uh, well, it's not completely horrible. It's definitely not pleasure reading. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's not teaching English. Uh, and secondly, like, uh, I actually... I finished this book about a month ago, and I'm just now getting around to reviewing it because various reasons I've been distracted by this and that. Uh, so this, unfortunately, by the time I get to making this review, this book's already getting a little foggy in my memory. So this won't be as sharp as it would have been if I had made it a month ago. But. Uh, but whatever. I, I'm just going to go ahead and, and say what I do remember about this book. So, uh, why did I read this book? Uh, well, again, for professional development. Um, but also, Dave Willis is someone who's been on my radar now for a couple years. Uh, people have mentioned him as one of the founders of the lexical approach, uh, along with Michael Lewis. I think Michael Lewis, because he because he's more forceful and more controversial, kind of attracts more attention and is kind of the better known name, but apparently Dave Lewis is actually, re sorry, Dave Willis, uh, Michael Lewis and Dave Willis. Dave Willis is the one who came up with a lot of these ideas first and was a pioneer of the lexical syllabus. Uh, this isn't the lexical syllabus, this is just kind of his book on his thoughts about rules, patterns, and words. Um, so, it's, yeah, let, let me talk about how it's set up first. Uh, roughly, I think it's divided into three sections, or at least there were three sections that jumped out at me. The first part, he's talking about how students don't always learn the grammar that the teacher tries to teach them. Uh, so again, the CELTA present practice production method. Uh, the teacher presents a grammar point, the students will kind of do, do it in controlled practice and do the exercises. Uh, but then as soon as you go back to like normal speaking, then they go back to making the same mistakes that they always do. Uh, so he, he, he talks about his experience in the classroom observing that. Uh, and that's quite well written, actually, those beginning sections. He uses his own personal experience. It's, you know, it kind of reads like a story. He injects a little bit of humor into it, kind of laughing at himself in the curriculum. Uh, and then he goes around to explore why this happens. And I think, if I understood this correctly, his, his thinking is because uh, it, there, it takes some time to kind of reset the patterns. Um, you can't just kind of override the patterns that the students have learned in just kind of one quick lesson. So as opposed to the PPP method, he never says the PPP method directly, but he seems to be arguing against it. He's got a separate, a separate framework here. Improvisation. So in order for the students to know that they need the language, they first have to be kind of pushed to improvise beyond their capacity. And then that, that makes them aware that there's gaps in their language which will make them more receptive to the input. Then he's got learning processes here, which is actually, he kind of sneaks like four kind of stages in here. Recognition, rehearsal, system building, exploration and then consolidation, and then spontaneous use. Um, now, all of, all of these stages are described in more detail in the book. Um, and he, he appears to be playing the long game here. So this is, not, this is not over a period of 90 minutes. This is over a period of several months where these different stages will take place. Um, it, I think it looks appealing. The, the only issue I had with this was, I mean, at least in my school, I only have the students for four hours a week. And like, I've been learning from personal experience. You really can't do much with them. 
in four hours a week. I mean, if you had them for like, uh, if, if you had them for 15 hours a week or 25 hours a week or something, then, then that would be different. But if you're in a private school and foreign language setting, uh, it's, it's tough to find all the hours to do all this, as well as the input. Now, he, he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the input, but it seems to be an assumption in this book that the students are kind of being continually exposed to input, and that's where their system building is coming from. I, I have been trying in my classes a lot to introduce a lot more input. Um, and I have found that that really takes up a lot of time. Uh, so it's, it's, it's something he never even talks about in the book, but like I wonder where is the time for all this input coming in? Is this in class time? Is it out of class time? Uh, I guess, you, you know, Maybe ideally input would be taking place outside of class. The students would be reading and listening outside of class. But again, in my experience, most of them don't. Uh, you know, you can assign all the homework you want, but they don't do it. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe that's just my own personal frustrations. I, I just kind of wondered where the time to cover all these stages would be. Then the middle of the book, he talks about kind of word patterns. Uh, and his contention is that the grammar of the sentence is determined by the choice of the words, uh, not some sort of like abstract grammar rules. Uh, so he, he gives like examples. So for example, like you, you learn in grammar class that the structure is subject, verb, object. Um, but that's actually not true. A verb like laugh doesn't take an object. Uh, a verb like buy demands an object, and a verb like put not only demands an object, but it demands an adverbial of place where you're putting something. So like you can't say, I put the book. You have to say, I put the book on the shelf. So in other words, the structure of the sentence and the word patterns kind of go right together. Um, now, to the best of my knowledge, this is not controversial. In fact, I think like he, he never uses this terminology, but I think if you're, if you're talking about like syntactic structures in a linguistic class, this is what they talk about. They use theta roles and uh, generative verbs. I, I, I don't, I've not formally studied linguistics. Uh, he, so I, I don't think that's controversial. He's just making it available to ESL teachers. Uh, and it's not I mean, I think he's right that it's not the way most ESL textbooks are structured, at least in my experience. They tend to be structured by the verb tenses, like this is the past simple, the past continuous, the present continuous, the past perfect, the present perfect, and they go through all those verb tenses, but they don't spend a lot of time on word patterns. Uh, and he's arguing that actually the, the word patterns are what we should be focusing on. Uh, this, a lot of this is kind of the same thing that Michael Lewis argued in the lexical approach, but uh, Michael Lewis argues this with a lot more kind of um, forceful language, uh, controversial language, um, whereas he just kind of lays it all very methodically. Uh, and by the, the, the time you get done reading it, I think it, it's very hard to disagree with him that he has a point. Uh, so that's that's the good point. The good point is it's all methodical. The the bad point, the disadvantage, is that it's so methodical that this middle is really kind of boring to read. Uh, I often found like as I was reading it, and it was just kind of going to describing all the different word patterns. I really had a hard time focusing on the book. Like my eyes would glaze over. I'd get bored, I'd have to go back and read sections again because I hadn't been paying attention. Uh, so uh, the whole middle section is uh, good, but it's really a slog to get through. Um, the other point, I guess, in terms of like day-to-day -day teaching 
practices. It seems more aimed at curriculum designers than it does at the teacher. Um, because the teacher often, unless you have kind of freedom to make your own curriculum, which at most schools you don't, you have an assigned curriculum, you've got certain grammar points that the students need to learn for the test, uh, and you really, you don't have a ton of freedom to kind of go off, and even when you do, I've kind of learned from personal experience, uh, when you try and rewrite the whole curriculum and make all your own materials, you just work yourself to death. I mean, like, it's so much easier just to stick to the textbook rather than trying to fight the textbook. So I, I, I wonder how much, I mean, I think it's good knowledge, but, like, I think it's something more the curriculum designers have control over, over the teacher. Uh, then the last section, he talks about the differences between spoken English and written English. Uh, and this is quite interesting. It's, it's, he's not the first author I've encountered who's uh, talked about this. Uh, Steven Pinker has talked about this. Scott Thornberry has talked about this. Um, but it's interesting because it's you know one of those things that you seldom think about. But uh, most of the grammar rules that we think we know uh, don't reflect how we actually talk in real life at all. Uh, they just reflect written English. Uh, and he, he, he says briefly there's historical reasons for this. The reason is, uh, historically, kind of in you know 18th century or whatever, when people were writing grammar books, they would examine written English because that's all there was to examine. Spoken English was spoken, and then it would disappear into the air, and there was, there was nothing to examine. Uh, so they, they just went with written English to, to describe the grammar. Uh, and that's why when you actually record people talking, uh, they, don't, they don't talk grammatically at all, at least in the, what we've been traditionally taught as grammar. Uh, there, there are a number of things. Um, written English, for example, has kind of more complex clauses, whereas spoken English is additive. We just kind of add phrases one on top of another. Uh, rather than putting them in, in more complex sentence structures. Let me see, he gave a really good example of this. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Oh yeah, uh, so this, this is an example from the corpus data, uh, something that a student really said. Uh, his cousin in Beckles, her boyfriend, his parents bought him a Ford Escort. Uh, so she just kind of adds phrases on top of each other. Whereas, if this was in written English, you would have to say, he has a cousin in, par in Beckles whose parents bought him a Ford Escort. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's interesting just to think about, uh, you know, because you, you so seldom think about these questions. And I, then I think it has implications for teaching as well. And he goes into some of those. Uh, he says, a lot of the textbook materials, they'll have listening exercises, but it's not, it's not, and they'll have a conversation between two speakers, but it's not a real conversation. They script it ahead of time and get actors to read it. And so they clean it up so that it resembles more kind of textbook English. Uh, he says speakers should be, sorry, students should be exposed to more authentic uh, spoken English by just kind of recording native speakers doing a task. Uh, he, he has this in a task-based learning framework, I think. So he suggests that the native speakers are recorded doing a task that the students will later have, later have to do. And you just record them using like authentic spoken English with all the kind of full stops and the ums and the ers and kind of everything like that. Uh, and then you use that as your listening exercise for the students. Um, I don't, Scott Thornberry makes a point when discussing the same issue. I don't, I don't remember if Dave Willis said this, but Scott Thornberry says that you, you're actually making the listening burden easier for the listener with this, uh, because, uh, spoken English just kind of adds information instead of nestling it in complex sentence clauses. 
Uh, and that's easier for the speaker, but also easier for the listener to process. So he says when we, when we create these listening exercises that have complex sentences in them, not only is it unnatural, but we're, we think we're doing the learners a favor by cleaning the language up, but it actually just makes it more difficult to process in real time. Um, right. So, so those are the three kind of things that jumped out to me about this book. Uh, the, the framework he talks about for as an alternative to the presentation practice produce stage uh, and then a very long middle section where he talks about sentence uh, words and sentence patterns and then uh, an examination of spoken English at the end. Now I to me, it almost seems like there were three separate points being made in the book, and I'm not sure what the overarching theme was to all this, if it all kind of tied together. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't see an overarching theme that connected these. It could just be because I'm missing something, but I thought there was like three distinct sections. I, well, at least that's what I came away with from the book, kind of three distinct sections. Um, each, each which was interesting in their own right. And I, th I think that's all I have to say about this. So I'm gonna sign off here.